So this is about uh, the image-based ecological information system and the original hotspot or photo ID algorithm that it's, it's built on. Um, <clears throat> so you guys have a great logo for the workshop, but we're pretty excited about that one. <laughs> so this one was um, uh, made by the now husband of uh, one of our postdocs on the project um, while we were at Old Pejeta, Old Pejeta Conservancy in, in, in Kenya. All right, so here's the IBIS team. Um, Tanya Berger-Wolf, I think, is, uh, I just saw her sign on. She had sent me an email a couple hours ago saying she couldn't stay up and go. Um, but anyway, Tanya is at University of Illinois, Chicago. She's a computational ecologist. She's a computer scientist. You've heard of computational biologist. She's at, and she's done a lot of work in that area, but she's actually focusing much more on ecology now. Uh, Dan Rubenstein is a professor at uh, Princeton. He's a, um, a specialist in equids, uh, and he just stepped down from 23 years as department head of ecology and evolutionary biology at Princeton. Um, there I am and he has, a, I've been department head of computer science for about a year and a half and he has absolutely no sympathy for me. Um, and so Tanya actually took this picture of me in July in Kenya. Uh, this is Jason Holmberg from Wild Me, some of you know him. Uh, so that picture kind of speaks for itself. Um, he's in, in, and this is the team we had in uh, Kenya this summer. And there's um, two of my graduate students, John Van Oost works with Jason, um, Blair, uh, Blair and Clara, and I can't, oh, blanking out, um, are ecologists and, um, this is terrible, he's showing the sign of my age. Marco is also a computer scientist, Tanya's graduate student. So it was a great team. Um, so I'm going to start off by talking about the ecology side, and this is kind of my view as a computer scientist, so I'm going to make lots of mistakes, and I'm glad Dan has gone to bed and isn't watching this. Um, so anyway, um, and, and Lex set this up quite well, um, but let me just go in and show my understanding. So there's obviously the site recite statistics, but we asked Blair, when we were thinking about the design of the database, we asked Blair for her view of it. Now, she just finished her PhD with Dan in, at Princeton, um, and she spent a lot of two years at Old Pejeta in, in Kenya. So we asked her, how would she like to use a, inf uh, a identification system and the associated um, supporting infrastructure database, ecological database since and I'm not going to read this all, but she, she wants to know about date of birth, offspring, last sighting, um, weather and frequency of sighting, and try to infer um, the life history, if the animals or certain animals are alive, if there's a si significant gap in sighting. And um, this was very uh, in insightful to us, and then we were very pleased to realize that our design could support all of these queries. Tanya's work with Dan, um, which was the genesis of this project, is on social networks. And so these are um, inferences of the kind of manual inferences of the social networks of um, plain zebras. You're interested in long-term social network dynamics. And the left, you see uh, three Grevy zebras and a bunch of plain zebras on the right. And very interesting that by being able to identify these animals, and this well predates my involvement in the project, the social structure of these two species, which can interbreed, um, so you'll see, uh, you'll see hybrids between these. So they can interbreed, but their social structure is very different. The, they, this, the plain zebras show a harem structure with the stallion male guarding the small harem and the bachelor males are around it looking for their opportunity. The grevy zebras, the, the groups tend to form and split quite differently, and the males guard resources, with the dominant male guarding the water. Um, so just very different, but you only know that if you, you can know where the individual animals are moving. Whoops, let me go backwards. Um, 
So another interesting question that um, Dan and his, his new students are working on is uh, trying to understand the, the competition for land between the Grevy zebras and the onagars in northwestern Kenya and South Sudan. Um, and then, of course, there's the classic predator-prey dynamics. We're only showing lions and uh, wild dogs. What you don't see here is there's actually a dead zebra here. And this was an amazing moment we had last summer that we actually saw these dogs kill a, um, an impala. It was, it was amazing. Um, very, very impressive animals. And our software is actually starting to be used on wild dogs. I'm a big fan. So the, quest, the, the issue here, in, um, and I've had some conversations with people already, we, our problem is actually a huge amount of data. So we have lots of data. So there we are um, on Safari taking lots of pictures. And you tend to take huge numbers of pictures. And you get uh, lots going on in one picture. And then you look, and this was a, kind of a defining moment for me in January. I thought I had taken a clever set of pictures. And I looked, and I had a complete mess. Um, and so then the question becomes how to organize it. But then you have camera traps and get the pictures at night. And you have to, you know, if you're going to de develop insight, you have to be able to identify the animals at night. And so uh, Tanya earlier, they put a stereo system on ultralight. Um, and then in, uh, in uh, I think it was March, a team from MIT met Dan. And they l were looking at the fixed wing very quiet. And I think there's a, a difference. The um, zebras are very skittish. Um, and they spook easily. So there's a big concern about using um, uh, quadcopters, which is really what I would like to do for lots of reasons. Um, but the, of course, the other problem in Kenya was while we were there this summer, they, the Kenyan government grounded all UAVs, um, which was really a problem. So here's a summary on image sources. This is just a small snapshot of a bunch of pictures we, I, that were taken. And this is just a few of them. Um, so what you get is there's huge numbers of sources. And so we have humans. We have, obviously, sciences, scientists, technicians. But now we're moving toward trying to get exploding numbers of images from tourists. And this is a big part of the project. Uh, and then, of course, there's automatic. There's UAVs. But we also stuck. GoPros and put them at very high resolution and lower frame rates on safari vehicles. So now you get an enormous volume of data. And so we might, at one conservancy, reasonably collect close to 100,000 images a day. Huge numbers of images. So we, uh, over lots of late night discussions, came, we kind of built this project really in January. And Dan came up with this wonderful phrase, is that our software was determining who the animals were, when, they, when and where they were active. So who, when, where, so that, this, that the conservationists and the ecologists can determine what they're doing and why they're doing it. And so what we're going after is very fine-grained resolution in space and time for the images. And one implication of this is, can you push toward full autonomy in these identification algorithms, or 90% or 95% or 99% autonomy? And that's kind of our motivating drive. Um, and a number of people have already talked about, thought about this, discussed this. Certainly, there's a biased source of data. And now, if you're collecting data images from tourists, you've got yet another bias problem. And of course, so we've started very beginnings of a study of this. It's biased by where the camera locations are, uh, the sensitivity of the, of the um, camera traps, and of course, the quality of the image. If you're flying, you've got the geometry of the route and location, and, and then the resolution, although what we saw earlier, the resolution was very good. Um, and of course, if, you ha if you're taking pictures from a vehicle, you have certainly the observer bias, what you're actually going to take a picture of. Um, and species fatigue, and who is a charismatic species. Um, despite the fact that most of this talk is, uh, most of the data in this talk is about zebras, 
on safari, people take pictures of zebras and then they're ready to move on. You know, they're, 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 zebras don't have, for the ordinary tourists, don't have the charisma of the rhinos, the lions, the giraffes, and the elephants, and leopards if you're lucky, um, and cheetahs, of course. Um, so here's a quick example we took, this, we did this summer. And so this picture here is if we had it, we, we lined up on the same tour and experienced tour, photographer and tourist versus a novice. And you can see the experienced person um, has a fairly steady rate, whereas the novice takes lots of pictures in the first hour and then they drop off quickly. And you could do the same analysis and I'm expecting even m bigger differences as we look at, break this out by species. So the, so the result is we have uh, lots of biases according to species, locations, and we have to focus this in and tr determine how this affects population counts and all the other estimates we can come up with. So that's kind of the preliminary about the data. So let me give you a system diagram about the IBIS system. Um, so we're looking at the input data from field scientists, camera traps, UAVs and um, individual citizen scientists, so contributing pictures now or later. So these images come in, we have signed of a image verification, make sure they're not showing pictures of downtown Chicago or um, Yonsu. Um, so we have filtering, pre-processing, and you saw in some of those pictures we had taken pictures of animals and then pictures as, as we were working, and you'd like to filter some of those out. Um, so these immediately go into the database, but then they also are processed by the, our analysis. So we have detection, labeling, uh, according to species, individual identification, which of course is the heart of the discussion today and tomorrow, and then analysis of the habitat that they're working in. What we produce are annotations in each image and then summary information about the encounter we had. They go into the Wild Book database, which stores who, where, and when. We have some citizen, the goal is to incorporate some citizen science um, to aid in the annotations where possible, and also training in the um, training of the algorithms. And then on the outside, you have scientific analysis, education, and outreach, and then, of course, eventually insight. So this is a quick. Um, summary of Wildbook. So Wildbook is an ecological data uh, management system and data scheme with underlying databases. Um, uh, so some people are already using Wildbook and I think Jason is still awake on the west coast of the US. Um, so they, there's a, in addition to photo information, they've also incorporating genetic data and really, and other, um, other metadata. And then exports in a number of ways to GIS systems to, and then there's the ways to manage your data and exploit it in a variety of ways. And I apologize, Jason, if you're listening, you could do a much better job of representing this than I can. All right, so now we're transitioning to the image analysis part of the talk. Up, oh, no problem. <laughs> Jason just texted in, no problem. But you notice I asked him last week for a different picture. You're listening, Jason? Of a, instead of sitting on a chair with a snorkeling gear and a computer, he chose to leave that picture. So he's a good guy. All right, so this is um, images are in court, it, organized into encounters. And Jason smiling, good. OK, we'll stop referring to Jason, at least chatting with him by uh, um, 6,000 miles away or 7,000. So in the, um, when you encounter a group of animals, and this is one of the things that struck me, not only do you see a lot of them on the, but you see a lot of mixtures of species. That was one of the things that kind of blew my mind. You know, you're taking a picture of a zebra, there's, a, there's an impala there, uh, there might be a kudu, a giraffe, um, just lots of mixtures of species. Um, and you tend to, and there are lots of individuals, so, and you don't take just one picture. So there's lots and lots of pictures at once, and so you have to try to make sense of this. So the processing flow is not, 
you know, when it gets down to the, some of the technical stuff, I'm going to be talking about individual, picture, individual images. But the processing flow and the organization is about multiple pictures at the high level. So you get a lot of images, so we do define a primitive encounter, and this is a little different from what go goes on in the Gar Darwin core terminology. Um, but we take the images contiguous in time and space, and that is what we have our primitive notion of an encounter. And so here is pictures taken on the, uh, one of the high plains on the w um, west central Olpegeta this summer. And one of the things that we can do is organize those images into spatial temporal mosaics. And this is something that's more in concept than reality. This is an auto-generated mosaic by my company's software. So there's, there are 18 images combined there. And you can think of that image as one time. But then as you're taking multiple images, you can actually insert the images over time into the, wherever they fit in this organization. And the point is, you don't get the full network and social dynamics from a single picture. You've got to use multiple pictures and infer relationships, both spatially and temporally, across multiple pictures. And again, these are the types of in insights that we come up with only by being there. Um, so those of you who I'm hoping to work on whales with, I'm looking for that invitation. Um, but you can see, even in this small picture, we get a, th uh, a fairly high resolution picture of an individual zebra. So within all of these pictures here, we want to identify all the zebras and all the other animals. So what we want to extract is what we call annotations in each image, which start out by simply identifying the locations of the animals and their species. So we know the software automatically knows that these are plain zebras. Or excuse me, these are plain zebras and those are grevies. Then, and this is getting to some of the questions Lex was uh, discussing, is if you've got multiple pictures of an animal, you can link them across different views. So this is one particular grevy zebra, and we were able to get that zebra from all the different views, and now we kind of have a 360 picture of this. You know, it's not a 3D picture, but it's a 360 graph linking all the way around the animal. So now we store all of these in the database. And then once we've linked up the image, the animals we've seen in an encounter, we're going to match the individual against the database. And you either, are, if you're lucky, you will see the same view. Or if in, let me correct that. Um, by having multiple views, and then multiple views of the same animal in the database, you have a much higher chance of actually being able to identify it. And then you have, as you're matching, you expand the database. So for example, if you've only seen one or two views, now you bring these images and you've seen multiple views. And of course, if it's a new animal, you have to, of course, add it as an unnamed animal and then apply whatever naming conventions you have. And then, of course, at the end, in addition, you have to combine this with all sorts of metadata. Simple, obvious ones are things like GPS location and time, but also sex and other observations. For example, now you want to identify um, the habitat in which the images are um, being taken. So this is the area we've done the most work. Um, we, we've got. Uh, this part hasn't been integrated with the system yet, but we do have annotations in each image, link the animal individuals across images, and then match. And I'm now going to talk about two algorithms. Oh, let me just. So this is really very much a work in progress. Um, the hot sp in this identification, Tanya and her students started with a stripe spotter algorithm, um, got me involved, and we came up with hot spotter with my student, John Crawl. Um, but we did this kind of um, shoestring, and we got our first significant funding in August. We had some gifts before that, but we've got a, an SF grant um, to get started in August. So this is all what we actually now call our duct tape version of the whole IBIS system. Um, and the philosophy is get it out there, try it, refine it, and keep improving. So it, the goal is to produce annotations. And we can currently recognize various giraffes and zebras. 
um, eventually we want to characterize habitat as well. Because again, we're talking 10 to 100,000 images a day. And so in more detail, you would like to be able to identify these individual animals, give their, a, a little bit about their life history, when they were born, um, who the, in the um, parental relationship. So in this particular case, we would know that this is the, the foal of that mother zebra. So then the question here is how we do detection. So we've got the image, and we want to find and say that, that those three are, are Grevy zebras and those are impala. So that's what we want to be able to do and put a bounding box around them. Whoops. All right, so this is a technique that uses recent work um, in random forests. So uh, a random forest is like a decision tree. So it's, if you've looked at a decision tree, it's multiple decision trees where the decision being made at each node of the decision tree is learned automatically from the data. And one way to think about it is we're just going to pull out a bunch of different patches. They're about 30 by 30 pixels wide. And those patches are going to tell us two things. They're going to tell us, is this likely to be from a zebra, a Grevy zebra, for example? So what's the likelihood of that? And the second thing it's going to tell us is where would the center of the zebra be? So that's what it's trying to do. It's trying to analyze both where is this, is a, is this a zebra and where is it? And so what you get is these are voting not only that I'm a zebra patch, but where, my, where the center of the zebra would be. And of course, you might think about it with these vertical barcode, just vertical stripes. It doesn't work very well. But for the patches on the side and the rump and the shoulder, it does work quite well in their prediction. So what you can see here is there are um, three kind of hot spot centers um, where in this, what we think of as a heat map, where we think the center of the zebra is. And then we basically put it down at the center. And so the decision tree might go down, and the w it would have multiple trees. I think in this case there are 30 trees, and 25 of, 25 of them would vote for particular patches being uh, Grevy zebra, so we have an 83% vote. And we do this at multiple scales. We do this at six scales, so we can find the zebras that occupy a big portion of the image or the ones that occupy a very small part of the image. And then at the end, you have multiple overlapping boxes at different scales, and then you do what non-maximum suppression to pick your actual box, and the ones that are chosen are in red. And that's the way the algorithm works. So here's some example detections for plain zebras. Some of them are quite nice. Um, we got these three, um, and this one that's hidden both by this zebra and the um, grass in the back. And by the way, this is work of Jason Parham, one of my other students. So I have two students really actively working on this, both who, of whom were in that picture from Kenya. So this is Jason Parham's work. So this is a very nice uh, result. Uh, these two are also fairly well segmented out. You see it didn't quite get the b top of the back, and that's because the first training data we had kind of stopped at the top of the back, and now the modifications, it will actually incorporate almost all of the zebra. And so here's some cases where it didn't work so well. Um, it got more of the foreground zebras, but it missed the background. And interestingly, um, at least sometimes, for example, this zebra is actually quite identifiable. So here are some Grevy zebra results. It got this rump there, there, and there, um, and missed some of what was going on in the background. It got these four, so it did quite well, and it missed that. Not too terrible. Um, but here is actually probably the worst case. And it got this full, um, but it missed the others. 
And that is in part due to the fact that the training data we had was viewpoint dependent. Um, and this is again getting to the point. Because of the pr previous protocols, the, all of the data that we had were based on side views. And with a, the simple of the side view, is you took the picture of the Grevy's facing to the right and the plain zebra facing to the left. And we're trying to get past that. All right, so we, ha we were able to form a very challenging data set, only at side views, but lots of occlusions. We got 80% detection rate, and that means we actually found the animal and were very close overlap with the ground truth. So most of the misses, um, a lot of the misses are actually the boxes, bounding boxes slightly, somewhat off. Um, the failures are almost always occlusions or oblique views. Zebra is outstanding by itself with very little overlap to the other ones, we get it basically all the time. Training this particular algorithm um, takes uh, roughly eight to 900, 1,000 ROIs. So this particular algorithm um, requires a fair amount of training data. And if you've um, heard at least some of the, either the, the literature or the popular press on computer vision techniques, Huge amount of work in machine learning over the last 10, 12 years. Huge amount of progress in uh, using neural network techniques over the last six or seven. All of these algorithms are tremendously data hungry. So that is a, that is a bit of a problem. But we have this training data, and, and I want to stress the point that the training data, this is for the detection algorithm, not necessarily the recognition algorithm. Can I just ask you, please? What is an RLI? Uh, region of interest, so it's, okay. I'm, I apologize. Uh, no, it's fine. And, and then the, the training means somebody is sitting there and saying, this is a Grevy, this is a plane. And putting a bounding box around. Putting a bounding box. Yeah. So somebody visually a person right. does that a thousand times and trained us. Yes, Thank just you. the detection part. Okay. And so this is the challenge I've issued to Jason, is to both improve this and, and bring down the number of training. So this is a very a large problem right now with the most advanced machine learning algorithms. Execution time is two to five seconds, two to four seconds on a multiprocessor server. Um, plain zebras are a little harder to te detect, so we had to train more of trees, so it's a little slower. Put it on my laptop and it's like um, six to eight to ten seconds on a server, or per image. So now we're going to move to Hotspotter, which I think is what some people have been um, kind of the basis for the original invitation. Um, so here is a bit of our wall of fame. And I want to be a little careful here because some of these are more test prototypes. We're fairly confident on certain species, uh, leopards. Elephants are uh, surprisingly easy. You'd think they're not. They actually are. They're very wrinkled. Um, uh, but we haven't tested this fully. Um, we've done frogs, Grevy zebra, obviously. Uh, rhinos, it's not clear because they like to roll in mud. Um, I took these pictures with nothing between me and he. And it was a moment. <laughs> um, we've done some work in seals, some prototype. I'd love to talk to you guys about this at some point. Um, so these are um, uh, jaguars in the US. A little bit on whale sharks, but um, I don't want to overstress this one because we're not detecting the spots very well yet. Uh, wild dogs are relatively easy. Uh, Nautilus, um, toads didn't do so well on toads. Lionfish, giraffes are easy. Um, wildebeests are hard. All right, so just to stress and think about this, it's very difficult to compare zebras by people. You have to, and it's very interesting, the first time I sat with Dan uh, a couple years ago and watched him go through the identification process manual, they have a whole coding scheme for, for starts and stops and movements around the animal. Very interesting. And then he was shocked that our software used completely different information. So there's only three different individuals in those pictures. This one is alone, that one's seen twice, and all of these are the same animal. 
All right, so challenges, lighting, occlusion, viewpoint, time and age, quality of the images. Um, and for, so for example, that's a, ju a fairly young animal and there's a picture of the same animal as an adult. So now on to hotspotter. Now, um, the current hotspotter algorithm, and what I'm describing is actually a couple years old, um, is there's not a great deal of technical insight in this algorithm. It was really a baseline algorithm. I think from the point of view of um, most of the people here, we're not, the, this algorithm I'm going to describe is not matching one animal against one animal. It's taking one animal and trying to find it quickly in a database of 4,000 or 6,000 or 8,000 animals. So it's really, this algorithm is designed and optimized it for one against very many. So it's a, it's a fairly classic algorithm, at least over the, the basic over the last 10 or 15 years in computer vision. We want to e extract key point locations, and I'll show you what those are. Those are places where there's a lot of high variability in the images. And we want to then describe them. Then what we're going to do is run indexing against a very large um, approximate nearest neighbor database. So the, 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 one of the classic computer science problem is given a long vector, 100, 1,000, 10,000, find the nearest vector. It's a very, very difficult problem. Lots of people have been working on it. So we want to build this search data structure to make this relatively fast. Then we're going, when we're matching an individual image against the database, we want to take the key points, match them against the database, pull out the matches and score them. Then we want to take the, the top matching image set pairs of images and verify them and throw out the in spatial inconsistencies and then we produce a ranking of the individual names of the animals. So I'll go through these in a little bit of detail. Um, so we start off by finding key points and building descriptors of them. So let me give you an idea. You might pull out these regions and so the center of this region is a place where the intensity is varying quickly in all directions. What you do is you take this region and it's an ellipse and if you think about an ellipse, think about it more as a squashed circle or an expanded circle and what you want to do to try to correct for different viewpoints is you want to normalize that to a circle and then orient that appropriately so that whatever view or direction you're looking, you would see that more or less from the same picture. And this works up to about 45 degree skew. Um, beyond that, you run into problems. Then what you want to do is you want to take the circular region, break this up into a uh, uh, 16 by 16 histogram, and build it within that histogram, you build a, or you build a histogram of direction, gradient directions and you pull that apart and you get this one long 128 component vector and people have taken this up to 5,000. Um, so you think of this as, and then you normalize this, um, so originally it's a unit vector but then you scale to do integer arithmetic and this normalization is an intensity normalization so if I just brightened that image I would still pretty much get the same answer there within a certain range. We take our database images, the images we're going to match against, we're going to build a search data structure from those, all of those key points we pull out. It's, I'm not going to spend much time, it's called a KD tree, and we build a forest of these KD trees. Um, so now, what we've got is a single, we're going to take our new picture of a zebra. And we've found the ROI, we've, the annotation. So we've got that bounding box. And what we want to do is pull out all the key points and say, OK, for each key point, what other zebras have a similar key point? That's the question. So for, um, and so we pull out k plus 1 of them, where k is a tuning parameter. So we take our query, the, the image we're trying to match, and we take each one of those 2,000 descriptors, normalize it, go into our database, and we pull out k plus 1, and k is usually around 6 to 10. Um, and that, that is a subject of current work 
Um, so we might have a nearest neighbor distance of 1,400 and then a nearest distance of 42. So let me explain a little bit about what that is. But I get k plus 1 matches. So I have k matches and then k plus 1. So I could have k different animals that might look similar to this one. So it could be Fred, Sue, Tom, and then the next one could be Tom, Paul, you know, whatever. I'm using very English names, I apologize. Um, but one key point could match K, will have K matches. The next one might have a different, another K matches, and two or three of them might be consistent. So those two images now, those two different names are going to start to build up votes. And the question is, how much vote how much weight should I give each key point? And so the intu intuition is places where I have those stripes, where they all look the same, should get very low weight. And places where there's a lots of complexity should get very high weight. But sometimes a stripe might be very isolated. And you say, well, maybe that should get high weight. So here's how it works. We've played with several mechanisms. The one that actually won in our experiments surprised the heck out of me. But we've recently figured out why it actually is correct. So we have our 42 and our, we have, say, a 42 for match for Sue. And we want to normalize that and see how well that works. And the mechanism we came up with is, a is based on a naive Bayes mathematical model. And it's very simple. It's the distance to the k plus first minus the distance to the kth. A very strange sounding idea. You could look at the ratio, you could look at the log ratio, or you could simply count matches. And then, as I said before, you accumulate scores for each image in the database across all the descriptors. And then you rank. But here's the surprising thing, is that this is the one that won. And the intuition behind this is that the distance to the k plus first is kind of a measure of how crowded it is in my search structure around this area. So in other words, how common this current key point is. So if, the, if there's a big, if the distance to the k plus first is big, it means there's not that many descriptors, which means that feature is relatively rare. Um, and then the distance to the kth, which I'm subtracting off, is how good the match is. This is way more important than that. So it's kind of a measure for our quality of matches of how rare the descriptor is versus how good the match is. So we're going to sum this over all of our database images. Um, and database images that have no matches at all never get summed. And there are very fast algorithms for handling this. Now I've got, say, 50. I've got my query image, and I've got 50 different candidates. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, I'm going to look for inconsistencies. I'm going to do a spatial verification. And we're going to do this with modelless images. So here's a query image, and here are the two matching images. It's a little hard to see, but if you look at this, all of these are kind of going parallel to each other intuitively, whereas these are kind of going off in different directions. In this third match, there's not a whole lot of them. So the idea is I want to estimate let me see if I have it. I want to estimate the mapping from this image to this image based on the mapping. And there are, again, well-established ways in computer vision to do it. And then any match that's inconsistent with this mapping gets thrown out. And so if I have a random set of matches, I have 50 good matches in one image and 100 random matches in the other. Those 100 get whittled down to, say, 20. And so what was lower becomes higher. And so you can see the results after this filtering. So I'm, again, trying to estimate the mapping here. And anything that's inconsistent with this mapping gets thrown out. And you can see here, most of these gets preserved. And most of those get thrown out for being spatially inconsistent. And then I simply rescore. There's also a way of matching one image against one image, in which case I pull out, um, I actually build my search structure for my query image for each database image and each feature there. I find the two best. 
and form a ratio. It's a very classical algorithm, goes back to David Lowe in the early 2000s. Um, and then we include the spatial verification. So here's some results, and these are, these are two years old. So I had 1,000 images, 600 different animals, um, and basically 97% of them, oh, 97% uh, of them was the top ranked match. And all but six were in the top five. So again, this is a ranking algorithm like many we've seen. For plain zebras, we had actually what originally looked like um, better results. Now we've gotten a richer data set. We're cl it's very clear that plain zebras are harder than grevies. The matching for the grevy zebras are in this region and in the shoulder region and around the nose. The plain zebra, this is the most important. This area comes out and then sometimes over there. Um, very good results for a small set of jaguar images. Uh, giraffes are easy. And lionfish, um, uh, we had a very small data set when we wrote this first paper and it worked perfectly. Uh, since gotten a bigger data set, they're very, very difficult. Um, it still works quite well, but um, and then here's some timing results. Um, if I'm going against a database of 1,000, it found the best match in four seconds. So one against 1,000 works in four seconds. Um, one versus one was 75. Um, and the interesting thing, the important thing to note about this is if I jump this to about 10,000, it doesn't change the query time by all but a second or so. So it scales very, very well. This, of course, goes up by a factor of 10. Um, plain zebras are even faster, and then these are fairly quick. Failure modes, um, heavily oblique views. OK, so this one, it was not able to pull out the correct many matches. Heavily oblique views. Um, we actually had failures in our database. We've actually discovered inconsistencies in our database. We had another case where um, because of the way people were taking pictures, when you ran into a group, they were taking pictures of one spot to make sure they got everybody. And so what happened is we were matching the background because that was repeated. We could see that background. Um, we have since uh, fixed that relatively recently by uh, developing a model of which features are zebras and which aren't. Basically learning, it's not a complete segmentation because segmentations of zebras is quite difficult, especially when you've got lots of them. Um, we had another case, so this one's fixed and in, in fact it turned out about half the failures were that. Um, we had other cases where we had multiple zebras, the label on one the, the, you could actually see its head, a head of another zebra in the back. And so we had the picture of the animal for whose head was appearing, but the label was the other animal. So it was kind of a false error as well. Um, but large variations in pose is huge. And I think I need to skip the, I had there, I'll quick demo the software. I think I'm running out of time, so let me. Uh, if you're interested, I can demo the software on my laptop. It's through all these major stages. So looking ahead, all these algorithms I still consider to be prototype. Um, Hotspotter 2 is coming out in January with an improved scoring mechanism, much higher level of automation. Um, very, very heavy use of multiple images and viewpoints. You get lots of repeated Im images um, and then a lot of these algorithms um, need to have an imp incremental database construction and that's um, not that particularly difficult but the current algorithm does not have it. Whoops. And then in January uh, Jason Parham and I are going to um, back to Kenya. Um, we will have an integration of the current version of Wildbook that uh, Jason Holmberg and John Van Oster working very hard on. 
Currently, we are doing like th three species in, in the current IBIS fully trained. We will go, we're hoping to land with six detection models fully trained. And then um, this is being uh, tested at Leowa Conservancy. Um, and they're ramping up their citizen science efforts, so they're really going to work very closely with me, so, us, so we're very excited about that. But from the algorithm point of view, Hotspotter 2 will be coming out, much improved, um, pretty excited about it. Um, and then lots of challenging uh, computer vision questions. So concluding thoughts. Uh, huge data volumes, lots of questions about bias. Uh, lots of compu computational questions associated with those huge volumes, but from the biology point of view, the big question is uh, a big question is bias. Goal is to, from the software point of view, is to determine who, where, and when, so we can enable the the ecology questions of what and why. Um, that we've had, we're getting fine-grained resolution in time and space in these images and heavily exploitation of redundancy. But we've already had some, vic some real successes with this. Uh, Dan and his students in the spring um, ran some kind of blanketing photo surveys in two conservancies, each of which, one of which thought they had a small number of zebras and one thought they had a large, and it turned out it was reversed. And in fact, the one who thought they had a lot of zebras also had too few recruits. Um, so then, for me, the interesting question is how far can we push the computer vision technology? Um, I'm sure the detection in the hotspotter will improve. How many species and what level of autonomy? I've been surprised at what we've been able to do. We did a quick test on polar bears and had some success, but it was a small number of images. Here is, to me, what I th think is the intellectual challenge from the computer science side. Can we learn to automatically detect and identify individuals for new species? Do we have to have a, you know, right now it's hard to do, some species are very hard to do, but there's many, many species we'd like to do. Can we, ran, can we have a faster ramp up than training individual algorithms? And so here to me is the ultimate test of whether or not this thing is going to really work. And, you know, if you ask Tan Dan, he would give a different answer. If you ask Tanya, he would give a, she would give a different answer. But to me, here's the ultimate. I am out on a safari. I take a picture of an animal or five animals. And within a few seconds, it pops up. Here is the name of this animal, its life history, its parents, its grandparents, who it's been seen with, where it's living, where it's working, or, you know, um, how much it makes per year. <laughs> um, but it really, this to me is kind of the ultimate test of success from an intellectual point of view of an algorithm like that. And I'd like to say I'm not going to quit until it's done, um, but it maybe I could, should say that if we can get enough research funding. And of course, research funding for this work is actually a very big problem for all of us. Um, so thank you. And I'll quit with this unbelievably gorgeous logo. <laughs> thank you.